from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, also, if there are questions afterwards, you will be giving your permission to be filmed, if you don't mind. Um, I actually have a very easy task this afternoon um, because Bob Adelman needs no real introduction. He will tell you who he is himself. Um, but uh, he is really here with us as a first uh, appearance as a consultant in photography. We're very proud that a new program being sponsored by Roberta Schaefer to bring uh, Bob to us for four different lectures over the course of the next couple years is being inaugurated with this, this talk this afternoon. Um, Bob has been a photojournalist for more than uh, 60 years and uh, very active, having begun in the civil rights movement uh, in the early 1960s. He was a close friend of Dr. King amongst all the leaders for the uh, uh, SNCC and CORE, the, the groups that were active at that point in time in the movement. Um, his work in photography is endless. Uh, I, every time I speak to Bob, I find out more subjects whom he's photographed. And uh, not only that, but he has been involved in the publication of more than 50 books on a great variety of topics, including civil rights, including uh, many authors and artists. So this afternoon, you're very fortunate to be getting a preview of his book on Andy Warhol, whom he knew uh, when Andy was a mere child, I guess, right? Um, in 1965, and it's uh, the first 15 minutes of Andy Warhol. So please enjoy the next uh, visit with Bob Adelman. I can't see you, but I guess you could see me. Can Eddie. Right here. Right here. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm used to talking to myself because I always get intelligent answers. Anyway, <laughs> the uh, uh, it's a, uh, I started to say I can't see anybody because of these lights, but uh, I, I, uh, I think the most important aspect of this uh, will be what appears on the screen. Uh, I uh, unfortunately don't have the Warhol book. It's uh, uh, it actually in the process of being reworked. Uh, uh, a great uh, German publisher, uh, Schirmer Moselle, who uh, did... Uh, uh, who, who I guess does some of the great photo books of our time. Uh, they, uh, his first book was on the Beckers, and uh, uh, he photo he's, he's published uh, Struth and uh, Gursky uh, and Wall and, and, and many other uh, of our most important modern photographers, and. Uh, He's done a few of my books over the years, too. Anyway, uh, I met with him when I had got, uh, gotten the book together. I met with him, and he asked to see my contact sheets, uh, and he made a suggestion. And uh, we'll, well, actually, so we are beginning to revise the book uh, uh, based on his suggestions, and so. Yeah, you can let me know what you think of it. I I think he's uh, on to something, but I'll explain why why the book's both delayed and uh, hopefully being improved. So uh, you're uh, all involved in the creative process of making this book. Now, uh, I uh, uh, at this time it was sixty four, sixty five was very involved with the civil rights movement, and uh, I had done, I, I had begun to become published. I started as a volunteer for uh, CORE and SNCC, and um, be began to become published, 
I guess in 1963, my uh, photographs of the uh, uh, Birmingham demonstrations, uh, the water hosing uh, there had become uh, quite well known. And I uh, began to actually uh, make a living as a photographer working for magazines. And, uh, but I, uh, while I was, but, but the civil rights movement was going on, so I, I, I used to say I did my, I did the Lord's work in the morning and in the afternoon hung out with people in the art world, uh, many of whom became quite good friends. Uh, uh, I, at this time, had already spent a lot of time with Larry Rivers and had actually uh, had gone to Coast Guard Beach in uh, East Hampton where all the abstract expressionists hung out and played on Saturday night poker, <laughs> which was uh, kind of, uh, it's very interesting, artists hang out together, photographers, uh, not so much. Uh, uh, Alfred Eisenstadt, or Izzy, uh, used to say that photographers were like spiders. They, they didn't, uh, I guess it was not uh, uh, a good idea to be with other photographers. You know, and if you were at a public event, they, they only got in your way. So uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, my first studio was on 72nd Street in, in uh, uh, New York, and uh, down the street on 78th uh, Street, Leo Castelli had a gallery, and uh, my friend Jim Rosenquist uh, uh, had exhibited there, and it was kind of, I guess, an art hotspot. Uh, of people like Rauschenberg, Lichtenstein, Jasper Johns, Frank Stella, all belong to this gallery. And uh, uh, the, one of the people whose work I uh, very much admired was uh, Andy Warhol. And he just had been accepted in the uh, uh, Costelli Gallery. Uh, so uh, uh, what uh, really struck me and uh, I found really uh, fascinating were his Campbell soup cans. Uh, he had done these uh, Campbell soup cans all lined up and uh, I interpreted them. I mean, that what they meant to me was that uh, he caught something that had happened uh, to American life. It had become standardized and organized in a, uh, a, a you know, uh, in the machine age. And that these images uh, told us a great deal of, uh, about our life. Uh, anyway, I, uh, uh, I met him in the gallery and, you know, I said I uh, admired, you know, his work and I'd like to spend some time with him. And he was very, very flattered I, uh, and very cooperative at this time. He later became much more remote. Uh, in fact, it, it, he, he, when he'd become very, very popular, sometimes he would send a lookalike to appear at a public event. <laughs> to <laughs> uh, uh, He had, uh, I, I, you know, I guess fame could become wearisome, but but Jim Rosenquist told me, but he was very eager to be well known. And, and Jim, Jim once described to me how Andy had showed him uh, how if there was a celebrity around and there were photographers taking pictures, that if you slowly w walk backwards, you could get into the picture. So, <laughs> so he was... Uh, uh, he was very interested and determined uh, to be well known, and I, I, I think that's why I, I had uh, unusual access. Uh, aside from that, I, I, uh, uh, I, 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 before I became a photographer, I was trying to figure out uh, the purpose of life and why I shouldn't do myself in and studied philosophy and my particular field of interest was aesthetics 
And so that uh, uh, allowed me to understand uh, better and to see into uh, artists' work and to talk to them uh, intelligently. I think they, uh, I, I later became, I, I spent a lot of time documenting Jim Rosenquist's work and, uh, and then later uh, I, um, oh, I, I guess a few years after this, Roy Lichtenstein and I became really uh, best friends, and we would talk, uh, you know, while he was painting for many, many hours. So uh, I, I just, uh, you know, uh, was very drawn to uh, the arts and uh, particularly painting, and so this was a great great fun for me, really, and very different from, and a great relief from seeing people hitting each other over the head and doing uh, uh, disgrace, disgraceful things. Uh, anyway, uh, so the reason I, uh, the book's called Andy's First 15 Minutes is, of course, he's famous for saying that everyone should be famous for 15 minutes, and uh, Andy had uh, more than his share of uh, 15 minutes. And uh, I suspect now he, uh, the, the French have an expression uh, which is uh, uh, the, the secret to life is first become immortal and then die. And, <laughs> and I think Andy succeeded in, uh, becoming immortal, but at the time that he died, uh, it wasn't clear uh, that he would become uh, uh, what he is today, uh, which is, uh, I live in Miami, and there are two, uh, two artists that people know, uh, Andy and Pablo, and uh, he, uh, he has definitely become one of the immortals, and uh, it's curious why that is, but uh, I, uh, I, uh, my understanding, which was is somewhat limited, uh, is that for one thing, Andy's um, emergence or existence was foretold, like the Messiah. Uh, he had it was said that. Uh, uh, he, he was coming. Walter Benjamin, who is one of the great uh, German art critics in the 1920s, uh, he was, a, I guess, a Marxist and a me member of the Frankfurt School and a, a very revered figure in the art world, uh, uh, had uh, said uh, the art uh, of the 20th century will be done by worker artists using photomechanical means. And when Andy's silk screens appeared, the Cornoscenti, uh, the, you know, Tom Wolf said there were 300 people in the art world who determined what was valuable and important. Uh, they, they knew that Andy's uh, importance and existence had been foretold. The other pop artists, uh, uh, who, who I uh, knew, uh, like Jim Rosenquist and uh, uh, Roy Lichtenstein and Tom Wesselman, uh, they painted, uh, 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 I guess, in a way that looked like it was machine-like, but they painted it, whereas Andy used uh, photomechanical means, a silkscreen, to create his image. And... Uh, I think uh, that that radical transformation to machine-made art, and Andy talked about uh, having a factory, and uh, people in the art world were shocked, I mean, that a serious artist would have a factory. Well, uh, in the history of art, it's been a frequent ambition of artists to be able to, you know, reproduce their work. Uh, in the German Renaissance, Kranich had uh, uh, done 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, Cranach had done an uh, important uh, painting of Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, and uh, uh, his uh, uh, painting was so uh, uh, much loved of, of Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, that he made 300 of them. And uh, of course, Rubens is uh, famous for having had a, 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 a kind of a factory of sorts. Uh, he just finished off what his assistants had done. Uh, but uh, I, in Andy's case, the, the, uh, the work was actually manufactured. And for most artists, uh, or, or excuse me, most connoisseurs and most people who value art, uh, the idea of the artist's touch. I remember people loving uh, to, to look at Michelangelo's drawings because you could feel his touch there. But the, the modern sensibility, uh, somehow that idea of feeling the artist's touch has diminished and uh, the two of the most important artists of our time, Jeff Koons and um, uh, the uh, English artist of uh, Hearst, Damien Hearst, uh, all their work is manufactured and they have serious factories. I mean, Andy's factory was one, uh, just one, a paid assistant and some volunteers. It wasn't terribly serious, but uh, 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 my, I think when I saw Jeff Coons, I, I think he said he had over 100 people working for him. And he doesn't even own his factory. It's uh, a part of a corporation or something. Well, anyway, so I, I, I don't know if this is a good enough explanation, but, but Andy, uh, Andy became a central figure, though when he died, uh, the, the people in the art world mostly thought, well, he, he is uh, not as important as he once was. He had done very important work to begin with, but uh, he'd repeated himself and other things had happened. But, uh, because, uh, you know, in the last, uh, since his death, the last 30 years or so, uh, uh, he has become so important that this period will probably be called the Age of Warhol. Anyway, uh, I will now give you, uh, you know, some sense of uh, what I saw, and uh, I was just starting out. I could take sharp, clear pictures, but I wasn't as accomplished as I hope I later became, but uh, uh, here's the beginning of uh, uh, the book. Uh, that's Andy in a uh, supermarket. Uh, I, I had the wit uh, or foresight to understand that Andy would become the avatar of consumerism and uh, as far as I know was the only person who ever took him in a, <laughs> a supermarket, and we filled his uh, uh, cart with uh, uh, some of the things he was famous for. And uh, the uh, uh, supermarket was a Gristides, a kind of grim uh, place. He, his studio was on 47th near 6th Avenue, and uh, it was a, a, a kind of a grim place. It was a, a old-style bodega, probably. But uh, he he walked around and said, "Beautiful." And I'm, I'm looking at him. I mean, I, I uh, because uh, I, and I thought he was putting me on. I mean. Uh, uh, I, I'd, I'd seen people do stuff like that, but in fact, that was, uh, <clears throat> he really felt that way, and it was a very different, uh, it was a very different feeling from 
uh, the way I certainly felt about uh, going into a supermarket. The other picture I'll explain. Well, I don't seem to be advancing the picture. Is a uh, anyway, that's just a. Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, well, uh, the, the two uh, sides on the left were the way the book be normally began, but uh, the German publisher said, well, you know, a Andy's work is very much si in, uh, serialized. There are multiple images, and so and you've taken many pictures of him uh, in the same situation, so that it would give a Warholian look to the book if we included these other photographs. So this is uh, still in contention. I very much value your opinion when we get uh, you know, done as to whether this is a correct way forward. Uh, uh, oh, do I? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I guess, Marchand. Anyway, the uh, the, uh, the the uh, Andy. This actually is a pose picture, and uh, uh, of Andy. And uh, I, uh, as I say, misinterpreted, or excuse me, I I misinterpreted, uh, or didn't well understand what he intended, but as I say, the idea of uh, soup cans being lined up, uh, uh, I was at the uh, 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 IBM exhibit at the World's Fair, and I saw all these people being lined up. Uh, this was called the People's Wall, and uh, it struck me that, well, not only are they processing projects now, they, they, they're processing people. So the, the uh, photograph uh, uh, was of a wall that moved. And as you uh, uh, went to the exhibit, the wall, instead of uh, your moving, the wall moved. And I, I, to me, it seemed an image of people being processed. And uh, anyway, so it's, it was an homage to uh, Andy, but uh, I later was uh, th thought about it, and there's a, a Walker Evans picture, which is probably at the Library of Congress, uh, of uh, the photo a window of a photo studio with all these little pictures of people uh, lined up. Uh, uh, that wouldn't be in the book that way, I don't think. Anyway, this is uh, Andy in the... Uh, He's posed for me, and uh, these are uh, his uh, flower pictures, which he was, uh, I guess, in the process of making. And uh, these are uh, these paintings are all, uh, 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 you know, I guess, manufactured. Really, uh, all he did uh, when they came back from the silk screener was sign them and, uh, and, and of course, frame them. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, at that time, did a story for Esquire called The Artist is a Blue, Chip, a Blue Chip Investment. And uh, uh, the a small version I was given by Leo Castelli, a small version of the uh, white flowers, and it sold at that time, it was about a foot by a foot, and it sold for $600, and now it's con uh, it's worth more than a million dollars, and that's, so that would be 1964, uh, it's probably, what, 50 years, and uh, that's, that's pretty good, <laughs> a pretty good investment. Uh, so, uh, I, and we now know all these billionaires are buying uh, art like crazy. Uh, 
Now, that was the uh, double-page spread. This was Andy's famous silver um, studio. Uh, the, uh, uh, he, he decided at this time that silver was the new black, and <coughs> uh, the whole studio was either painted or uh, papered with, I guess that's aluminum, so aluminum silver foil was used as, uh, it, uh, uh, I, I must say the, the, the first uh, factory, uh, the, the, uh, the silver factory was, was in fact a, um, uh, an old warehouse. It was, uh, it was in a, it's now a wonderful neighborhood, but then was a rather dingy neighborhood. And, uh, uh, it was an old warehouse, and he they, they were trying to make it look somewhat presentable. Uh, uh, another reason I think that it was that neighborhood was selected, it was right across the street from the YMCA. Anyway, uh, now that's Gerard Belanger, who was his only played assistant, and um, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, do you feel these extra pictures add something, or? Uh, okay, well, <laughs> anybody say no? <laughs> um, and, oops, uh, we jumped ahead. Um, now, this is actually a historic picture. As far as I know, it's the only such picture. Uh, Andy, uh, uh, at this time, wasn't painting. He was mostly spending his time uh, as a filmmaker. And he was doing very uh, uh, unusual films. Uh, he would uh, take a uh, Bolex, uh, I think was the first camera he used, and he would, I think it either had 15 or a half hour a film in it, he would shoot the film and have it developed and it would be exhibited the following day. Uh, it, there was no editing uh, and he felt that was much more honest and uh, uh, more authentic. And he also uh, had famous people and other people, uh, particularly beautiful young boys, come in uh, to uh, his studio at uh, the factory, and uh, he had this lighting arrangement, which uh, um, is what I've detailed here, and, and they would take what he called the screen test. And they would sit there for four minutes. They could, uh, uh, I guess, uh, talk or stare. Uh, I think Bob Dylan stared for four minutes. Um, Baby Jane Holtz chewed gum in the most provocative way. It's one of the sexiest uh, films I've seen. Um, anyway, so uh, th this is Andy having his first screen test. As, as far as I know, nobody ever took this particular picture. and uh, it, it interested me, uh, not that I knew of its significance, but because it was a studio uh, lighting arrangement. Actually, what he often did is he, the way in which he supported himself primarily at this time was to do uh, portraits, uh, silkscreen portraits of well-known and very rich people usually. Uh, and he spent a lot of time trying to connect with uh, well-to-do people who would commission portraits, because that's where the money was. And uh, uh, so they would come in and uh, he would do Polaroids of them, which were then transformed into silk screens. Uh, oops. I'm sorry. I'm, oops. Uh, well. uh, this is uh, Andy at um, on the floor of the studio, and he spread out. Uh, this uh, this silk screen of a typical American man, and uh, my recollection is that the, these pictures are 
collected, uh, they're framed and then uh, held together uh, as one uh, uh, painting. And uh, the, uh, the uh, my German publisher, Lothar Schirmer, said that uh, not only did Andy admire this, the uh, Campbell soup can, uh, I mean, apparently, it, it's, it, we'll, we'll see it again later, but apparently uh, he subsisted on the Campbell soup. He'd have a bowl of soup at night when he was illustrating. And so he really loved Campbell soup. And, uh, uh, and uh, he liked the fact that you know, uh, it was a democratic food that, Anybody, rich or poor, could eat it. Um, anyway, um, he said, uh, the German publisher said that Andy learned the idea of uh, serialization uh, from going to the supermarket. And so uh, this idea of repetition uh, was something that very much appealed to him and he thought was very, uh, very, very beautiful. And he uh, he always said he was never he was not easily bored, and he, so he found it. Uh, uh, you know, I guess uh, uh, what would there be? Twelve typical American uh, men would be more exciting than one. So uh, now there's a <laughs> there was a phone in the. Uh, 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 in, in Andy's factory, uh, and it was a wall phone, uh, and if you wanted to use it, you had to pay, you know, put money in it. Uh, well, you could see with, uh, the, the factory was a place that drew people. Uh, it was a point, a, 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 a point of entry uh, where people uh, came and uh, could get discovered or, or be near a uh, very creative talent. Uh, anyway, I, um, uh, 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 there's a, a bunch of garbage there, and uh, people would leave notes for Andy uh, there, uh, on right near the telephone, and he'd find out uh, what was going on in the factory. Oops. Um, uh, that... Uh, Andy always was always reading something, and when you met him, he was always saying to you very, very uh, intently uh, 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 what's happening, what's going on. Uh, like all artists, by the way, uh, he was always looking for ideas. He was always looking for subjects. And uh, so when he asked you what's happening, he was... Uh, sort of uh, squeezing your brain to see uh, what you could, uh, you know, how you could help him. Uh, and uh, that's the YMC over to the left, YMCA. And this is, he had a fire escape, and uh, uh, this is uh, him on the fire escape. Uh, uh, he, uh, 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 well, I, 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 I like the picture on the, uh, well, where he's at the top of the uh, fire escape because he was just getting to the top of the world, you know, uh, top of the world, mom, uh, I guess. And uh, also, he was uh, a very, uh, well, I, I would say he was very comfortable in, in his sexual identity and... Uh, 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 artists, uh, uh, gay artists like uh, Rauschenberg and, and Jasper John were very uh, uptight about their sexual uh, orientation, at least at this time. And Andy, uh, as you can see, that's a kind of a flamboyant uh, or, um, uh, pose on the uh, left. Um, And uh, this is the notorious red couch. And uh, on the extreme right uh, is a picture um, from the uh, uh, Warhol Museum in uh, uh, Pittsburgh. 
and uh, the red couch no longer exists. Uh, a film was made called The Red Couch in which every known human perversity and every conceivable drug was ingested uh, on this particular red couch. And, uh, and Andy is in, um, I guess, uh, a kind of decadent uh, or, or it was a, a, the a grand maj or something uh, position. And um, uh, anyway, uh, Andy was uh, very, very careful with money. Uh, and uh, at one point, this couch uh, needed to be cleaned. And so uh, his assistants, uh, <laughs> his assistants took it uh, uh, in the freight elevator outside and uh, I guess washed it with water from the fire hose, uh, fire, uh, fire plug downstairs. And instead of, of course, I mean, any uh, less careful person would call an upholsterer in to clean it or something. Anyway, so uh, they left it downstairs to dry and it disappeared. And <laughs> so somebody has, uh, I mean, uh, 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 people have called me uh, about this couch and wanted to recreate it. It's a, I guess, a votive object. Uh, uh, and oops, uh, th uh, uh, this is uh, just uh, a suggestion of some of the things that could have gone on on this couch. Uh, that's B.B. Uh, uh, Hansen and Chuck Ween. He was uh, a young director, and B.B. Hansen was a runaway, and the daughter of Al Hansen, one of the important sculptures of, uh, uh, of, of our time, and uh, 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 Andy did a, a film called uh, Runaway about her, uh, and uh, uh, she also uh, happens to be the mother of Beck Hanson, so uh, a rather extraordinary family. Beck being one of the, I guess, important artists of our moment. That's Edie Sedgwick, who is the heroine of the Suicide Girls, and she was uh, Andy's star of the moment and uh, uh, a, a great fun uh, to be around. Uh, she was um, somewhat incoherent but very, very good to look at and great fun to be around. <laughs> um, and that's Andy as a filmmaker in, in the factory. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, lots and lots of pictures of him filming. And uh, his films are now being studied very seriously. And uh, I guess people are taking a greater interest in them. His film, uh, uh, I, well, I mean, just a personal one. <laughs> uh, he would, uh, he shot uh, uh, this film, which was a, about the runaway, and um, they, they, there's that, they're using the uh, uh, flower picture as a clapper. Uh, <laughs> That's a million dollar object now. Anyway, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 while this film was go being made, uh, uh, I was talking to Andy and I said, you know, I said, you're always asking what's happening. And I said, well, Runaways, I'm sure, are uh, of some interest, but, you know, the civil rights movement's going on, the anti-war movement's going on, you know, and and Andy said, well, Bob, you have to understand that uh, these people who come here are all exhibitionists, and I am a voyeur, so it's a perfect... <laughs> but anyway, when the film was shown, it was shot one day, and the next day we watched it in the studio. Uh, the, 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 this would have been uh, uh, all the people watching this uh, you know, film that was shot the previous day. Well, 
I was shooting two or three assignments a day, and when this uh, film uh, uh, went on, uh, it was, I guess, dark for a half hour, I fell asleep. <laughs> and uh, I assure you, you probably would have too. Anyway, because <laughs> they were mumbling, and it, it was just, you know, uh, uh, at least for me, it wasn't, I'm not a serial person. Anyway, uh, when uh, the lights went on, Andy saw me kind of rubbing my eyes, and he said, perfect. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> uh, uh, as I said, nobody uh, in the uh, uh, Warhol group was paid, and uh, Edie was a Sedgwick, which is of an important family in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, the founder, I think, was the uh, was a great judge in uh, Sedgwick, and all the Sedgwicks are buried in a circle around him, uh, with the understanding that on Judgment Day they would all rise up and only see Sedgwicks, and <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, she just about had gone through her inheritance, and Andy wasn't paying her, so this, uh, <laughs> this explains some of her annoyance at this moment. And uh, I, I, I think I, we, we, we're not going to see the whole uh, film, but uh, uh, well, this is Andy going out on the street, and you see he was always reading, always looking for ideas, and um, wait, I'm not sure why that's the way it is, but oh. And um, this is uh, Al Hansen, the father of the girl, yeah, who uh, is showing him a drawing for a match cover uh, of um, a baby Jane Holsa, who was Andy's previous girl of the year. Uh, I. Uh, anyway, I, I think I have to stop here, and I, I wish, uh, oh, this is, a, I'll stop right here, because this is uh, Andy's uh, most wanted man. It's a famous art incident. He had, uh, uh, for, at the behest of uh, Robert Moses, had uh, painted, uh, uh, murals of of uh, the ten most wanted men, and uh, uh, these were giant paintings uh, at the New York State uh, Pavilion. But they were um, uh, taken down before the, the uh, beginning of the fair. Uh, in fact, destroyed. It was uh, shocking. And uh, so he then made smaller versions, and they're on exhibit here at the Costelli Gallery at this moment. And the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of course the inside joke is that Andy wanted to be one of the most wanted men. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.